This video is sponsored by ChannelFireball.com and brought to you by my lovely patrons. Hello spicy people of the internet, Spice 8 Rack here, aka New Day, New Me, and welcome to a, a little, little bit of a different, or a, a fly just flew into my eye, wow, great, love that for me, um, a little bit of a different video, as you might be able to tell, uh, this is unscripted, I'm doing a little q and A. I I hit uh, 50,000 subscribers not too long ago, I'm coming up to 55,005 uh, at time of recording, which is very exciting. And I had originally wanted to do uh, wanted to do something else for my big sort of 50k. I've got things, I've got plans, I've got schemes within schemes. Uh, but unfortunately, the lockdown kind of uh, stopped that from happening. So I will be doing uh, another cool 50,000 subscriber thingamabob celebration. But for now, I thought I'd do a little bit of a Q&A. Answer some of your questions that you left on YouTube, Twitter, and my Patreon Discord. Uh, so let's get into it. Uh, Eugene Chalou asks thoughts, uh, opinions. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I can't say that I don't. Excellent. Love that for him. Uh, Mr. Melvin asks, who is your favourite Magic the Gathering artist? Uh, I think ever since getting into the game to begin with, Wayne Reynolds was the artist that really like captured my imagination. I remember, I think it was Goblin Boom Chuckers? Goblin Bang Chuckers. I just looked it up. Goblin Bang Chuckers uh, that really like, I was like, get rid of this fly. Get out the, get out of my office, please. Yeah, Goblin Bang Chuckers was the first piece of art that I saw on a card in the game that really sort of caught my attention. And it was because of Wayne Reynolds' uh, very unique hyper spiky hyper popping artwork and he's re remained one of if not my favorite magic the gathering artist pretty much since then so i'd have to say wayne reynolds is my favorite magic the gathering artist uh, next question and this is the first one that I actually got asked on my patreon discord and uh, it was from one of my mods ori asks what are my top eight spices uh oh i pro See, this is something that I probably should have prepared earlier, uh, but I won't. I'll go off the cuff. Uh, I think top, I got into like massive trouble earlier because I like conflated herbs and spices because I said parsley um, in like an original q and I did on my Instagram and people got very, very angry at me, including my sister, which is quite funny. Uh, so I'd say probably Chinese five spice, love a bit of cumin, uh, Coriander, I think is yeah. I like I like a bit of coriander as well. That's certainly up there. Paprika, one hundred percent. Onion granules don't really count, but I do love just putting them on eggs. Um, I don't know what, if I want to necessarily out myself on that on that horrid horrid culinary front. God, I can't think of like four other spices that I particularly like. Um, oh, nutmeg. Gotta go nutmeg. Pop that on top of a a nice. A nice like espresso martini. Oh, oh, you're having a you're having an absolute wild one at that point. Um, God, what a star anise. I'm a big fan of that. Oh, uh, saffron. Mm, oh, I love a paella or paella, however you're supposed to pronounce it. I always pronounced it paella, and again, I got yelled at on Twitch for doing that. I get yelled at a lot for my flagrant stupidity. Uh, what are the like a cardamom love cardamom put that with some rice as you're boiling it or oh, just have a grand on time and then I don't know what my last favorite spice is really I think uh I think probably I'd have to go with if I'm gonna pick one ginger yeah let's go like ginger those are my answers uh debate in the comments as to whether or not you agree. Also, quick bit about my sponsor, uh, ChannelFireball.com. Right now, if you use the code SPICE at the checkout when buying a product, signing up for CFB Pro, or just using it to book stuff on CFBEvents.com, you not only help out the channel by letting them know I sent you, but once they're in stock, the first 1,000 people who do use this code can get their hands on a funky and free token uh, depicting and signed by yours Truly, the tokens have not yet been made, but I've seen the sketches and they're very cool, so keep an eye out for them when they pop up. Uh, so yeah, if you want to help a boy out whilst buying some singles, uh, use code SPICE. Much love. Okay, back to the video. Uh, at NotFootPicks, 
Excellent. Next question asks, why did you make the first video on your channel? Did you expect your channel to grow like this? I got a couple of questions like this. I think another one from another user which asked what it was like to have gotten so big in the magic community so quickly. Um, Alex Cohen, yes, Alex Cohen asked that as well. Um, and to answer all of them sort of uh, in quick succession, uh, what made me make my first video? I was struggling with the fact that I wasn't doing anything with uh, my degree, with my education. I just finished my master's and I, my master's in transnational writing where I had created a methodology by which to teach and uh, rate, oh, not rate, what's the actual word for it when you do it academically? Grade, that's the one. Where, uh, to teach and grade uh, performance poetry or uh, spoken word performance. Uh, and obviously nowhere's hiring for that, uh, but I tried to sort of like try my luck at a couple of uh, like journalist uh, positions um, locally and sort of in London and the like, and all of them required some kind of backlog of work to submit. And up until then, I had literally nothing except for my master's thesis, which didn't really like cut the mustard as it were. Um, so I I began sort of like fiddling around with the idea of making a couple of like videos where I write scripts just to, and like edit them together just to you know give give me some kind of portfolio some kind of short uh, sh uh, short reel show reel to put out there. Uh, at, at the meantime, I was working like bars. I worked at a, a seafood restaurant for a little bit, um, which I really 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 hated um, with all my with all my guts and gusto. And not just because of like the work was naff, but the management themselves were uh, like rampantly homophobic and racist, which was uh, not fun, as you as you might imagine for someone who doesn't particularly like homophobia and racism. But then again, who does? Um, but yeah, like I was just working in that, making videos to kind of stop myself from like being bored out of my skull. Like I would go to work. I'd work for like eight hours, I'd come back home, I'd immediately work on like videos to get my mind back. I'd sleep for like a couple of hours and then I'd go straight back to work. It wasn't very healthy, uh, but I enjoyed it. And then the videos like began to do surprisingly well. It was just after my Goblins video came up. I think it was like two weeks after I released it that suddenly there was a massive uptick in people coming to the channel and, and it exploded. I think I went from a couple of hundred of subscribers, which was amazing. Like from the first three months of making YouTube videos to go to a couple of hundred subscribers, I really wasn't expecting that. Uh, then suddenly jumping up to like 15, 16K uh, over the course of literally a matter of days was uh, genuinely like unreal. I assumed that YouTube had broken, um, but no, it was actually happening. Uh, I didn't expect my channel to grow like this. I literally started it as a way to stop my mind melting um, but also, uh, I, w I did want to put out some stuff that I felt was lacking in like the sphere of stuff that I watched. I'm obviously a, a big fan of Magic the Gathering, but I'm also a big fan of sort of like lefty politics. And unfortunately, some of the bigger, um, like politically focused Magic the Gathering adjacent channels are quite reactionary. Uh, so I thought I'd just, I don't know, maybe, maybe put a bit of leftism in there. And hey, that caught on. There's a uh, surprisingly large amount of like lefties who play this game um, and sort of just like uh, apolitical people who are quite fine with um, watching someone who, uh, who who's, a, who's a bit of a communist. Uh, so you know what? Big up all that. That was a very long answer, um, but I hope that answered your question. Uh, and it's cool. I like this. This is, uh, I, I'm pretty happy with like where I am and being a big voice. Uh, don't stand me though. Don't do that. That's, I, I am but a man. All right. Next question. Uh, favorite two card combo from Simon H0894859595. Catchy. Uh, my favourite two card combo is Sheree Shizo's Caretaker and Mindless Automaton, wherein it effectively means that you draw a card uh, every turn, um, even if it's your opponent's turn. You have Sheree out, you take off the two counters from Mindless Automaton, who then dies, you draw a card because of that uh, effect's ability. Uh, it comes back at the end of the turn, 
and then next turn you do it again, it comes back at the end of turn. So if you're playing as I do in Commander uh, Sheree, and you have that out, effectively it means you get to draw four cards uh, per round of gameplay. So it's it's just amazing. Within two turns, you have a grip of seven. It's my favorite two-card combo by far. Second only to Sheree and Bottle Gnomes. Next question from Pig Lord Dude. Do you prefer Almighty Brushwag, OG Brushwag, or Badgery Boy? I have to say I prefer Badgery Boy to OG Brushwag, but Almighty Brushwag has a very special place in my heart. That boy has won me more limited games of like Ikoria draft than I care to mention. So if I've got to rank them, Almighty Brushwag at the top, Badgery Boy just at the second, and then unfortunately OG Brushwag just at the bottom. That's probably going to be a more divisive answer than my I'm a bit of a communist <laughs> um, answer, but we'll we'll move on. Zero Eleven asks, what thinkers slash authors slash philosophers slash artists would you credit as having shaped your views about art, politics, society, etc.? Uh, I think this gives me too much credit, honestly. I'm not a big smart brain boy. I don't like... I don't really read philosophy um, or like or like sort of the nonfiction that I read is for is primarily for like research um, into like the videos that I'm making. A lot of my like views about politics and society just comes from like lived experience of like, you know, working and <laughs> material conditions and the like. Uh, I think that's like I, I don't you know, you don't have to read. Lenin or Kropotkin or whatever to like know that hey shit's fucked y'all um uh, but like I do think that there are some like writers who certainly like shifted my perspective about uh art in terms of like the art that I want to create for example I grew up watching a lot of like uh early 2000s late 90s BBC comedy. Um, I say sort of late, late, late 90s, I also watched a lot of like Monty Python and uh, Blackadder, but you know, watching things like Black Books, uh, The Mighty Boosh, Space, stuff like that, and watching um, uh, comedians like, oh, what's his name? Oh my God, his name has just escaped me. Hang on, I'm gonna have to look this up, one sec. Stuart Lee, there we go. Uh, watching comedians like, you know, Stuart Lee, um, Richard Ayoade, uh, uh, well, I'm trying to think of other people now. Um, but like a lot of uh, British comedy and a lot of British comedians have certainly shaped how I write um, and how I perceive art in the sort of like abs the verbose absurdity juxtaposed with sharp uh, and crazy wit. Um, I think like those are the uh, those are the, like the biggest influences I have on like my perception of art. I'd say also horror is a huge, huge, huge influence in my, like, in how I perceive things, uh, just generally. For example, I binged Junji Ito, uh, like, all of his work during my last year of university, and I, and it's completely changed my perspective on gore, like, completely. For example, I've read, I think it was, I read Gyo, just before Shadows Over Innistrad came out, and when I saw Diagraph Colossus. Um, I'd re just read um, Gyo, and just before that I'd finished Uzumaki. Uh, and seeing, like, the gore and the sort of like, bodies, like, congealed together in some kind of great monstrosity, it's completely reshaped how I perceive uh, a horror and perceive sort of, like, that kind of uh, aspect of art. Um, so I'm a big fan of that. Um, but also, like, ha like having said, oh, you don't need to read theory, I have been reading, like, uh, a lot of leftist theory of late for an upcoming video that I'm uh, in the process of making, which uh, w which will be a lot more on the, sort of, like, uh, Yorgmoth, the scientific priestcraft of eugenics style of my stuff, as opposed to the uh, Boar and Oko side of my stuff, which will be coming out, um, hopefully, month after next. I'm just sort of in the process of reading that. Um, and that's sort of opening my eyes. I'm reading a lot of um, Goldman. I'm reading, uh, I've got Kropopkin and I'm getting through it. Um, but I'm also reading uh, uh, Rosa Luxemburg's uh, Reform and Revolution. Um, a lot of just like, just generally good books to have a little read. Um, I've been really enjoying Richard Wolff's um, A Cure for Capitalism, actually. Uh, democracy in the Workplace, A Cure for Capitalism. I think that's a really, really well-written, very accessible book. Um, 
uh, that certain, that's certainly sort of like um, shaped uh, and helped me understand uh, sort of like certain aspects of, uh, for example, like anarcho-syndicalism that I had not had not quite like put things together about. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I'd say about all of that good stuff. My next question comes from uh, another Patreon, uh, Tavina, uh, which who asks uh, if you were a bonder on Ikoria, what would you bond with? And then there are uh, six people who've responded with the Brushwag emote, and that's, yep, I'd bond with a Brushwag. That's the end of that question. Cometkins, or Ian, asks, what cards have tilted you the most? And then Ech, uh, Ech, Queen of Meat, excellent. Um, she asks, hard mode, you can't say drill bit. I wouldn't actually say drill bit. Uh, having played standard for the last couple of, uh, Oh, a couple of like weeks and months at this point. Uh, it's uh, a mixture of Agent of Treachery and Elspeth Beyond Death. I I'm tired. I am a tired man. I wake up each morning and I I wonder if I'm about to have my land stolen by a Yorion Fires player yet again. Whenever I log on to Magic the Gathering Arena, I am so tired from both of those cards. I feel like. Agent tilts me more just because when Elspeth Conquers Death comes out, it's like, oh great, in three turns I'm getting agented. And so the sort of the, the shock of the surprise of that horrid time goes away. But when Agent comes out on its own, it's just a hor it's just a bad time. Or when you get um uh when a, a Winota player um uh, just sort of locks out and finds one off of a single goblin attacking goblin token. That that tilts me. So yeah, Agent of Treachery is the big one for me. Noah, Sh oh hang on, I'm gonna have to pronounce this. I'm so sorry about this, Noah. Noah Schroeder, I hope I got that right. Asks, what established plane don't you want to return to? Um, in terms of like, I don't think there's any plane that I just don't ever want to see again ever. I quite like all of the Magic the Gathering planes for little bits. I am so tired, however, of Ravnica standard. I don't want to see another standard block with Ravnica in it. I I love that plane. I think it was a really, really good original idea. Return to Ravnica was right as I was getting into Magic the Gathering and uh, I loved uh, sort of like being able to revisit it again in sort of like last year. But I'm so tired of it. I am. I would love to see, you know, Ravnica represented in commander decks or in other supplemental products. Like you know, you get a, a reference to Matt Selesnia on some kind of like enchantment spell in Modern Horizons 2.0. This time we're going to break it harder or whatever. Uh, but I don't want to see another Ravnica plane at least for like a decade. Honestly, I'm really personally quite tired of Ravnica. Uh, zip code, aka Ziz. Oh, hang on. Zivko. Zivko. Ale no, Zivko Alexander. Zivko Alexander. God, I am so sorry about that. Um, Ask, what kind of music do you listen to? What are your some? What are some of your favourite bands or artists? I am, if you couldn't tell from the various soundtracks of my videos, I am a massive rap fan. I grew up listening to rap. I listened to the. Uh, the stuff that you would expect from so like uh, a white boy growing up in the like West Country. I listened to Eminem and Weird, Weird Al Yankovic, <laughs> and then uh, by the time so like I was growing up, I actually went to university. Um, like my sort of uh, understanding and appreciation for rap, not just in the states but also in the UK, exploded. Obviously, we've got um, amazing artists up right now in the UK like Stormzy, like Lil Sims, like Skepta, like JME, um, Big Up Big Jest as well. I've just um, like found out about him a few like weeks ago, really, and I have been bumping his shit. He's an incredible punchline uh, rapper. Honestly, fantastic. If you can listen to Big Jest Quarantine, it's, ah. Oh, Oh, it's it's beautiful. He's got a Sid the Sloth bar in it, which will which will make you cream, honestly. Um, but like aside from uh, those, I've got like in the US, I'm such a fan of artists like particularly like the Chicago scene, like uh, uh, Open Mike Eagle, like No Name. You've got New York rappers, like um, I actually don't know if MF Doom is a New York rapper. I've always just assumed he is because he's got kind of like. 
a similar flow to a lot of like New York rappers that I do listen to. Um, but I actually don't know. <laughs> God, I'm outing myself as a terrible uh, Doom fan. Um, but yeah, massive fan of uh, MF Doom. Aesop Rock particularly. Aesop Rock was kind of like a gateway for me to listen to uh, a lot more rap that I just wouldn't have before. Like Aesop linked me on to um, people like Milo. Um, Aesop linked me on to... Uh, Aesop linked me on to um, people like uh, Bus Driver and the like. I uh, I think they, I think even Aesop linked me on to um, Wu Tang. Uh, I do, I genuinely had never listened to Wu Tang until I listened to their uh, like their underground series uh, where they collaborated with a bunch of underground rappers. Aesop was one of them, um, and I, I do mean Aesop Rocks, not ASAP Rocky. They are two different artists. <laughs> um, I'm not so much a fan of ASAP Rocky, although I loved um, Potato Salad, him and Tyler the Creator. Incredible, incredible single that was. Tyler as well, big fan of uh, his more recent work, like Igor is maybe one of my favourite albums of all time. Um, it's, it's amazing. Uh, I'm trying to think of who else. Brockhampton, just bursting out of the gate with um, their three albums and then coming back swinging with Ginger. I think one of my favorite songs at the moment uh, is uh, If You Pray Right. Honestly, you stick a brass section in a rap track. Uh, it's my favorite rap track of all time, immediately. Uh, like, I listen to Nobody Speak by Run The Jewels for maybe for like three months straight just because it has a fucking trumpet. <laughs> I'm very easy to please. <laughs> Uh, I also like a big fan of like battle rappers, um, like uh, Shuffle T, for example, in the UK scene. Um, I think, oh, and of course, like, uh, I think, I don't know if I mentioned Earth Gang, but Earth Gang's uh, recent album, um, God, what is it called? Joy something. Hang on, I'm gonna look this up. Mirrorland, not Joy, where did I get Joy from? Uh, yeah, Earth Gang's Mirrorland is uh, amazing. Um, a fantastic, fantastic album. Aside from rap, I don't just like rap. I'm also a big fan of, so like, uh, folk music. I like listening to old, so like, union songs and the like. Um, also a big fan of, you know, people like Billy Bragg. Uh, huge, huge fan of the, like, local punk scene. Big up local boys, Idols. Uh, Bristol-based uh, punk band that got a lot of international attention, actually. I think they went up for... I think they were up for a Grammy or something like that not too long ago, maybe even last year, with their um, song Mother, which has the uh, most fantastic chorus of best way to scare a Tory is to read and get rich. Mwah, love that. And yeah, I think that's like that's mainly who I listen to. I'm also a big fan of like concept artists and concept albums in general, so like across the sphere, like you've got To Pimp a Butterfly, but you've also got um, uh, Aaron West and the Ro uh, Roaring Twenties. Thing, things like that. That's generally um, what I listen to. Big rambling answer, but I, I like a lot of music. Um, and I also like uh, my housemate Rowan like, listens to a lot of rap and I, um, I get clued into a lot of artists that I just do not, would not know otherwise. Um, so big up, big up him. Um, my next question comes from that guy Yeshim. Favorite basic land art? This maybe is a little bit of a, a strange one. I know most people pick like you know, the Bucket Island and stuff like that. But I really, really like Steve Prescott's uh, Lorwyn Swamp, the one with the lily pads on it. It's so rare to see, like, a nice swamp in Magic, one that isn't, you know, corrupted by death or pollution or something like that. Just seeing, like, what a swamp actually is, it's so refreshing. Easily my favourite swamp of all time and probably also my favourite basic land card. If I could just, like, if I could get a hundred of those just to um like what you call it uh, just to like pimp out my uh like commander decks i would uh, i would do that within a breath i love this card so much my next question comes from sharp adorableness incarnate uh who asks if you had to pick a card for people to ask you to sign at magic fest which one would it be sharp also was the one who designed the uh, that wag emote i talked about earlier big up sharp um if i had to pick a card Oh gosh, if I had to pick one, there are honestly so many. I've It's really cool when I like people ask me to sign stuff either because it's appeared in a video or because I've talked about it or because they just want me to sign a thing. Um, I remember I signed uh, Insolent Neonate, I think, for Sharp um, because uh, because I look uh, apparently I look like um, I look like the character in Insolent Neonate, which I am not going to complain about. That is a smoking hot dude. 
Uh, but if I, I don't know, if I had to pick one, I, I quite like, at the moment I'm on an almighty brushwag, like, vibe. I'm really feeling almighty brushwag quite a bit. Uh, I'm also happy with like drill bits. I'm happy with um, like charging badges. I've signed someone's um, Niall Sylvan uh, once, or I signed a couple of them, and they're like actually kind of expensive, so I feel like a bit weird about signing them, but also equally very, very happy. Any, honestly, if you bring me a card to sign, um, like I will almost certainly sign it. I can't really think of a card that I would not want to sign. Um, but yeah, like if you yeah, look at the if you want me to sign a thing, have a look at the video. See what see what maybe jumps out at you for something for me to sign. Uh, Tate Apture asks, when is Mill versus Discard coming out? This question, I got a lot of this, and I have addressed this on uh, live streams before, and I've addressed this sort of like just in uh, chats between commenters. But I'm very glad to actually answer this question in a video. Mill, hey, what's that? I've got to readjust my headset. There we go. Got I, got I got a new chair. Mill versus discard. Discard. Mill versus discard is coming out. Mill versus discard is going to be coming out. The idea of it was it was going to be my June video. I had plans to shoot. Uh, I can't. I don't want to spoil any of it. But I had plans to shoot uh, the scenes that I wanted shot. I had locations planned. I had the sort of like framework of what the script is going to be already on my computer. And then, uh, and that's been the plan for a really long time. I wanted it to sort of like be uh, a, a sort of like a bookend between the uh, Yorgmoth video and this one. So like, you know, around about the same time, release a sort of similar, like epic scoped video. Uh, but then unfortunately the pandemic hit and I really, really want to shoot uh, certain scenes with another actor. And, uh, and unfortunately the actor that I want to use uh, is, like it does not live in my house. Uh, so I, I am unable to, uh, and a lot of the, and the uh, like, uh, the person who, uh, Ray Roberts, who filmed a lot of my uh, sort of like, like hyper lovely, nice, uh, like uh, Ray Roberts filmed my, oh, what you call it? Uh, the two like ranking videos that I did, the best friends video and then the um, uh, electability video. Uh, fantastic, fantastic uh, creator. Um, uh, like editor, not editor, sorry, um, uh, videographer, but also creator in his own right. Please do go check out his channel. I'll probably put a link to it around about here. Um, uh, but I, the plans for it, unfortunately, were just completely scuppered by the pandemic. Um, and so I, it has been pushed back to whenever it is safe for a, uh, like for people to come over to shoot um, certain scenes and to like have a crew of more than like two people uh, who live in the same house. That is when Mill vs. Discard's coming out. I have not forgotten about it. It is not just a meme of the channel, um, but it is like unfortunately uh, on the back burner for now. And I've had to focus on other things just to put out. Um, but hopefully I've got some video, some nice choice videos that are gonna come out that will, that will sate your like big epic scope um, like needs and the like. Scout asks if an if the Ixalan conquistadors are vampires, do you think vampires on other planes are also pro-colonialism? Well, colonialism itself is vampiric. It is the act of a large foreign power turning up to a country, denying it its sovereignty, and then exploiting its people and natural resources to boost their own wealth by um, and in results like harming and corrupting the local populace and people. Um, and society in general. So like, I don't think necessarily that vampires and other planes are pro-colonialist. I think the vampires by their nature embody the, the very essence of colonialism. Um, but no, I completely agree with that. I think I like the idea. I like the, um, the aesthetic of the conquistadors being vampires. I think that was a very good metaphor. Going off topic asks, what sets were you most disappointed by and which was your favourite, both flavour and gameplay wise? Somewhat annoyed that going off topic didn't ask an off topic question, but you know what? We don't live in a perfect world. Uh, what were, what was I most disappointed by? In terms of gameplay, Battle for Zendikar was, I found to be a massive letdown in the, in the like the hype machine that had been built up since, uh, since Rise of the Eldrazi. I didn't feel invested in the war. 
Um, again, it didn't really feel like, as I said, like the asymmetry of like uh, one side struggling to survive. It really didn't feel like that because Battle for Zendigar had all of these god heroes on it that you knew were going to save the day. Um, like if like Battle for Zendikar had literally been, I don't know, uh, Ugin, Ugin and Jace desperately trying to like concoct a scheme to like prevent global annihilation, I think that would have been a really interesting uh, narrative, but instead it was just like super friends get together. But I guess you needed to have that to like form the gate watch to then continue to war of the spark and the like. Um, but I was pretty disappointed by just generally um, Battle for Zendikar. Uh, there were a lot of like flavor fails in it as well. Like for example, the, um, the awaken mechanic, your lands are colorless creatures, which means that they actually benefit off of Eldra certain Eldrazi cards, um, like Gruesome Slaughter um, and that like that uh, Ulamog's Runner or whatever that can grant colorless creatures haste. Uh, like that kind of stuff really irked me um, because it felt really bizarre to be playing colorless creatures and then benefiting the lands that the colorless creatures are supposedly destroying. Uh, so that was, Battle for Zendikar was probably one of my most disappointing uh, the sets that I was most disappointed by. Uh, I'll turn to, on the other hand, flavor-wise, I loved um, Eldritch Moon, which seems strange seeing as I just said that I didn't like the investigate mechanic of Shadows Over Innistrad. I felt that was a weak mechanic, but there's a train going by, hang on. Yeah, it seems strange to say like the Eldritch Moon was one of my favorite flavor sets uh, when I just said the Shadows Over Innistrad had, had like a weak investigate mechanic. However, the um, the sort of meta flavor of this transition from gothic horror to eldritch horror to like the, the 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 Lovecraftian stuff that has in recent years seen such a massive uptick in popularity, uh, and that has gone on to inspire like new weird like um, uh, Stranger Things and the like. I loved that metaphor being encapsulated in Shadows Over Innistrad, a still gothic horror set, which then, which then transitions into the eldritch horror of the Eldrazi. Loved that. I think even if the sets themselves were like, you know, there were some problematic cards, Escalate was a, like a kind of, it felt like a weird tacked on mechanic, um, but like things like Emerge uh, and the, um, uh, and like the Eldrazi horror creatures and some of the transforming creatures like, uh, what do you call it? Um, are the, the several of bloodlines or whatever that turns into a vampire goat horror. Like that kind of stuff. I loved, I adored that. Again, like talking about Junji Ito earlier, that set just like was, was a, a, a body horror fan's dream. Um, so that was probably my my favorite like set in terms of gameplay wise I actually really really enjoyed iconic masters strangely enough as like a draft environment um, Being able to like actually draft a decent defender deck and win the game through that I think is a lot of fun uh, So gameplay wise I actually think iconic masters may have been my favorite set that I've ever played with which is strange um, Rowan McDonnell asks which would you rather collab with Brian David Gilbert and Unraveled, or The Command Zone and Game Nights. Ah! I know that whatever I answer here, uh, it won't happen. Um, <laughs> so, mm. I, uh, you may have noticed, I'm a big fan of Brian David Gilbert. He, uh, going back to like the influencers question, um, lots and lots of YouTubers uh, like Brian David Gilbert, like, uh, let's talk about stuff, like Philosophy Tube like H Bomber Guy, like Sean, like there are so many YouTubers who I am very much inspired by that I, I, I would be too intimidated and too scared to collaborate with necessarily one of them on a big project because I would be overwhelmingly uh, anxious that I'm just gonna like detract from them. Uh, but like, I don't know. I honestly don't know. Um, I think like it would be a lot easier um, to collaborate with like the Command Zone and Game Nights and do like a Game Nights thing. I will say I am a massive fan of Game Nights. I've been watching them since I started playing Magic the Gathering. Um, and if you're, if, hey Josh and Jimmy, if you if you wanna, wanna get a boy on, I'll jump on a plane. We can work something out, it'll be nice. Uh, but yeah, I'd say probably just because I'd be less scared, I'd have to go with the Command Zone and Game Nights. 
Uh, Christy Sir Circuit, Christine, sorry, Christine Circuit asks if you had one aesthetic theme, steampunk, pirate, Egypt, ancient Egypt, etc., you could add to a future expansion slash story that isn't already in the game. What would that be? I think if I were to pick one, I, I like the. I think the, the a piece of art that stayed with me, magic related, is I think it's like this infinity staircase um, or something from a plane uh, from a plane chase card called Xerex, and I I like the idea of like an M C Escher like Penrose stairs type plane where like the you know the rules of physics don't necessarily uh, like abide where you're. Like you, you enter one room and you're suddenly like upside down on the other side of the castle. And so you go back through that door and now you're in a meadow, like stuff like that. I would like a topsy-turvy sort of like, um, like a like antechamber type uh, scene and setting. I think it would be very interesting to see how in a, uh, a world like that, a sort of, not to, you know, like reference Harry Potter, but like in a world wh whose like pathways are pretty much all the moving staircases from Hogwarts. Like, what what would a society look like like that? Who created it? What kind of conflicts would arise? Um, that that would be an aesthetic I would love to see explored. Although I, it would be very difficult, I have to imagine, to like create a story that wasn't just too off the walls. Um, that would be my choice. Uh, Harry Pottier, um, aka Harbear Six, asks. Love your videos. Um, you help me. Uh, you help get my sister into magic as she thought you were hilarious and is really interested in your lore slash MTG story videos. Oh, thank you very much, Harry. Uh, your question is my question is who's your favourite commander to play? Have played. I absolutely adore. Uh, it's not my best deck. My best deck is probably like either my Sheree Aristocrats deck or my um, uh, Felden of the Third Path. Oops, only dragons deck. Uh, but my favourite question has to be um, Noyendal the Royal Mage. Uh, not question, sorry, my favourite commander has to be Noyendal the Royal Mage, which is just a really, really bad Azorius cantrip deck where all your creatures are your lands and there are like three cards which stop them from dying. So you're always weak to board wipes, but it's so much fun. It's so much fun. It's easily my favourite deck to just like bring out and play and have a really silly time with because whenever you play Noyandar, everyone at the table goes, why are you playing Noyandar? Why not like um, uh, Talamir or whatever the, um, the Drake merfolk is, um, who is like objectively better. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I think Noyandar is my favourite commander to play. Tim Van Uden asks two questions, both of which I will answer. Uh, do you think that Black could be rewritten to be less evil? If yes, what possible qualities do you think could be given to be re to this rewritten Black? Or alternatively, I will answer both. Uh, what inspired Nikus, your mythic odyssey of Theros character? Uh, so the second one first, actually, because I think that one is like uh, a slightly easier one to answer. Uh, if you haven't seen, I am in a uh, series of Theros D and D videos with uh, people like Merchant, Alias V, um, Amy Amazonian, uh, and uh, Thrix. Oh my God, I can never remember how to pronounce uh, Thrix Sticks. One second, Thrix Six. Oh my God, there we go. Sorry, I, I. <laughs> it's I, I'm so sorry, Thrix Six. I keep forgetting how to pronounce your actual like uh, your at. Um, uh, but yeah, like we're in a D&D uh, &D campaign together and it's Theros based. And my character is um, Nikus, the uh, the perpetually different name. I keep calling him Nikus, Nikus. I don't honestly know which one's correct um, at this point. I just go with whatever the last person said. Uh, he is a Aetherborn, not Aetherborn, sorry, a Nyxborn, uh, a human thief who was born out uh, as a prank, created as a prank by the god of deception, Phoenix, in order to uh, destroy a poet's career. Um, I, the, the inspiration behind it simply was, I like the, I love like characters who have some kind of like inherent silliness or flaw, um, who you wouldn't expect necessarily to see on a grand adventure, um, but who can still, you know, hold their own in a scrap that's about. Not like 
ridiculous, like, oh, I'm, ju I'm just a mailman who accidentally turned out to be a barbarian or anything like, you know, silly like that. It's just like, just on the cusp of absurdity. Um, I feel like my poetry background, like, very much inspired the fact that, um, the, very, uh, the fact that uh, Nicus is a creature of poetry, created out of poetry, effectively. Um, but yeah, that's my inspiration for it, just sort of general silliness. And I also uh, love the idea of like uh, creatures being created out of art when that art is kind of whack. Uh, and then like having to live an existence as a whack piece of art manifest. Um, the first question, do you think that Black could be rewritten to be less evil? Black already isn't inherently evil. Um, like you have characters like Yeheni, you've got characters like uh, Toshiro Umazawa, like, um, Oh, uh, li the Liberator of Malakir Vrana, I think her name was, I can't remember. Um, who aren't evil, but are like mono black creatures. And I think it's just there, it's the, um, it's the willingness to do what a, uh, like something that you would maybe consider to be objectively uh, good, like, you know, your Gideons or your Ajani, you know, pure of heart and stuff like that. So, like, the willingness to take that extra step to maybe get their hands dirty, but to still do the right thing. Um, like, black is an individualist colour in magic, um, and it's all about, so, like, ambition and the like. But I, you can, like, easily twist that to, like, oh, I'm, like, I am an ambitious, much as they did with, um, like, Doretti and Angrath, who are, like, black characters, um, who, like, have this noble aspect to them, but they just go about it in a way that maybe would make, um, the puritanical planeswalkers of the universe maybe, like, blush and, and shy away and wring their hands. Um, so, like, you know, like, effectively, like, hardcore utilitarianism is, like, maybe the way to go about, um, writing a, a heroic, less evil black character. But we have many, many of them. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily, like, inherently evil. I would just, I, of course, would just like to see less, like, characters that are evil just, like, kind of lazily being slapped with, oh, you need black mana to cast this. Um, I think it is, as I said, a bit lazy. My next question comes from Jasmine, a.k.a. Jay Pickazard, uh, who asks, favourite and least favourite thing about each Ravnica guild and least favourite planeswalker. I, I'm not going to go through every single Ravnica guild because I think that would take... It's too much time. I think generally, like, uh, something I feel about most Ravnican guilds is that they're either a bit too polarized, like, for example, not polarized, um, sort of a bit too, sort of, like, caricature-ish, like, for example, the Cult of Rakdos, I'd like to see more depth in their, uh, in their, like, design and in their, sort of, like, representation. Can we see some people in, like, the Cult of Rakdos who are, I don't know, maybe fighting against, like, the the ethos of the guild, maybe working against it. I'd like to see dissent within guilds, effectively. Um, or that they are, like, they don't go hard enough on certain fun aspects. Like, for example, I wish that the Azorius would, like, lay off the cop angle and focus more on the, like, droning bureaucrat, like, uh, bureaucracy omancer angle because it's it's boring to like play magic cops but it's a lot more silly and fun to pay a uh, play like a high fantasy version of terry gilliam's brazil i'm so much more here for like that aesthetic uh, my favorite thing however though is like of course like fabric is an amazingly designed uh set and uh and, like the city itself feeds into it so much the idea of like a metropolis uh plane i love ravnica i don't think anyone doesn't um but yeah i think that's sort of like my favorite least favorite things about like generally ravnican guilds and my least favorite planeswalker ah it was actually domri because uh, boy did not do anything but now he's dead that feels kind of mean uh i think oh who is my least favorite place i don't like nissa um i i haven't really liked nissa for a long time i think she's a not the uh, don't she? Don't think she's my least favorite though. She might be my least favorite, like the the OG Gatewatch. Now that um, now that uh, Gideon's dead, uh, I'm trying to think actually. Who is? Oh, you know what? No, Rowan and Will Kenrith. I think they're boring. God, I think they're boring. They're boring aristocrat spark children. I don't care about them at all. I hate that like one of the precious few standard sets we got this year were about, were focused on them. I find them so boring as characters, so deeply, deeply boring. That's my answer. 
Uh, Giant Enemy George asks, what's your favorite future site mechanic that hasn't turned up yet? Gravestorm. Gravestorm was a mechanic on one card and I want to see if there's any way that wizards can do it that doesn't break it. Uh, we've seen like Delve came back and that was immediately broken. We saw, uh, what was the other mechanic that like wizards brought back that like kind of busted things open? I think that's the only one that's coming to mind so like of as like old or experimental mechanics that wizards put in that kind of wrecked the game. Um, but I'd love to see Gravestorm happen. I think it's a lot easier uh, to not break it up rather than like regular Storm. Um, because it requires not you just casting a spell, but you not only having permanence either in the board, uh, on the board, or uh, in your library, but also um, the whole like putting them into the graveyard, which you know, you can make some like sacrifice storm decks and stuff like that, but I don't think it would be nearly as powerful as regular storm. I think you could easily print Gravestorm and not have it break the game like, uh, like if you were to print normal storm. I'd love to see Gravestorm. Um, Manu Moore asked, what specific ability do you think would work as Evergreen? I think that Skulk would work perfectly as Evergreen. Um, lots of people have been pointing out that um, uh, every sort of like colour pair has a keyword like attached to it. Um, uh, so like, you know, you've got uh, Scry is very much like a red and blue uh, focus. Not Scry, sorry, uh, like Prowess was very much like a red and blue thing, which still kind of exists. It's just not so like keyworded um, anymore. Uh, like Scry existed very much more as like a... Uh, like a green and uh, blue uh, thing of a bubble. Um, but like blue and black was the only like color pair that didn't really have like a solid, this is like the color pairs uh, mechanic. You know, green, white has vigilance and blue, um, blue, white has flying, but like black, blue didn't really have anything except for this creature can't be blocked, which isn't a keyword. Skulk, however, I think is a very neat keyword. Again, it didn't really fit into like the overall flavor of uh, shadows. I genuinely thought they were bringing it in to shadows with the aim to then bring it in as an evergreen, hence its existence. Um, but yeah, I think Skulk would work as an evergreen keyword, personally. Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I'd, I'd feel. Either that or um, the can't be blocked by a creature with power two or less. Uh, that's like on so many cards. Uh, wizards could easily just evergreen that um, and I'd be done. Uh, Kvetchen think... Oh. Kvetchen think, thinks, eh, asks, what do you think colour should be situated in relation to the identity of the other colours on the colour pie? I feel like colourless is the... I had a couple of people asking what I would say, like, the ne the sixth colour of magic is. I think colourless is the sixth colour of magic, in so much that it is everything and nothing. For example, we're getting, we get keywords that we wouldn't necessarily find on, uh, like, a black card, for example. Um, uh, Vigilance, we found that on the, um, on the colourless, uh, Thopter-esque uh, creature, um, the Fox Finder, Farfinder, that's the one, from Ikoria. We have Vigilance on that creature, even though it's neither white nor green, and I think that opens up a very interesting space for colourless to be a, uh, for colourless to be, like, an everything and nothing colour. Like, the, the possibilities are endless with a colourless creature, but equally they lack a lot of the sort of coherence and um, efficiency of other creatures. For example, like a, I don't know, like uh, you wouldn't get a 2-2 two -two menace creature for two colourless, but you might get a 2-2 two -two menace creature in red. So it's not going to be as strong as necessarily like a coloured connection, but it is a lot more varied and wide. Uh, I think that's where colourless fits in uh, when you're not talking about like artefact creatures. Uh, Anakin148 asks, if you were a legendary creature, what kind of creature would you be? And what would your abilities be? I got a lot of these questions as well as like color identity. I think I am, I am definitely some form of red. Uh, I, I don't think I'm smart enough necessarily to be blue. Uh, I'd maybe, I don't know, I don't particularly like Boros because a lot of the theme of it is just soldier time. But I think, I don't know, Boros maybe, maybe Mardu. Um, I'm not Mardu, sorry, Jund, uh, potentially, uh, if I were a legendary creature. And I would 100% be a goblin that did something like, I don't know, uh, like try and convince people 
of certain, I don't, I don't even know what I could do. Maybe like, I don't know, convince people to join my side. That would be my thing. I'd be like a threatened goblin. I'd be, um, uh, oh, what's that uh, big dragon, the tyrant of Juns that gains control of all dragons. I'd be like that, but with goblins. That would be my abilities if I was a legendary creature. Um, Helwada asks, Dra, sorry, ask, would you rather fight one emerical sized squirrel, oh sorry, uh, yeah, one emerald sized squirrel or 15 squirrel sized emeralds. 15 squirrel sized emeralds, um, easily. Like, not, I would never fight a bit that, a squirrel as big as the cliffs of Dover. It sounds like a bad time. 15 emeralds sized squirrels, um, no, 15 squirrel sized emeralds every day. Uh, Sam at Sam Compu Consumes Pie asks, what my favourite goblin token is? And, I think it's got to be, again, I know Wayne Reynolds has done goblin tokens in the past, but I, I love um, the unsanctioned goblin. I love the unsanctioned goblin, uh, not unsanctioned, sorry, the um, unstable goblin, the one with like the spade and the, uh, the, the sticks of dynamite strapped to it. It's the most caricature-esque goblin, the one that done by uh, Dave Allsop, um, but I think that has to be my favourite goblin token. And then finally, uh, Magna Corsmo asks, will you heart this comment? No. Thank you very much for uh, listening and watching this Q&A. It's a little bit, you know, a little bit break from normal. It's a, a long old rambly video. Uh, I do have some Patreon credits to read out because this is an official video. So here we go. A massive thank you, by the way, to everyone who watches this, subscribes, is a Patreon. Um, and uh, a, um, a special shout out goes to uh, the following people who include a gay American couple, Adam Gable, AJ Ingram, an alt-right sleeper agent who gives money to communists Booker Idaka, Anthony Baker, Anthony G. Reap, Austin Clark, Bambi Roper, Biscuit Blade, Blake Evers, Bradley Hutchinson, Brian Dunn, Caleb Lake, Kara the Disaster, Carl Comstock, Chase Beard, Chris DeVos, Corin Stoddard, Causa, Darius Rudeminer, David Vestal, Dolowen, Drew Pierce, Dystopico, Easy Kyle, Edgar Salomon, Exidian, Elizabeth, Erica Hamel, Ethan Abraham, Flame Consumes, Georgi Lyubinov, Hooper Dup. I am only saying this because our global economic system does not intrinsically support artistic expression. In response, I bolt myself. Jake Colburn, Jessica Settle, Joss Solog, Joss? There. John Solog. Joshua F. F. Jesus Christ. Get your fucking vowels together. It's not even a vowel, it's a consonant. Uh, Joshua M. Stephan. Jude Big Boy. Julie Bunn. Carlia Whitart. Kansas to Jesus. Kieran Pollard. Curd Ape Apologizer. Kyle Van Linden. Lachlan McAllister. Liliana Vess, Queen of Discard. Lily Lord. Literally a ghost that pushes over candles. Linnea, Magic Arcanum, Matty O Tank One, Megan Kernum, Me, Michael Forbes, Mike. Oh God, hang on, I'm really sorry about this. Mike Mavro Mavromatis, Mike Mavromatis. Oh, that's such a cool name. Uh, Mordella Morana, Mister Skolaton, Moonimon, Papa Titan Fourteen, Raghava Cavalli. Ross King, Rowan Brown, Ryan Morgan, Sasha Evelyn Francis, Sean Cayuso Riley, Sen, Silent Celine, Sky Johnson, Stingray, Swan Hunter, the ble there, the best Swans player in Montreal, the Suavest Orange, Totally a Spy, Velen Beleren, Vittorio Grace, Vladimir Govakov, What's up, dog? Xenon and Zoltai. And to all of the rest of my wonderful patrons, all of the wonderful people who are currently still sitting through this, uh, giving me the, uh, giving me that watch time analytics, ta very much for that. Thank you to you, and as always, stay spicy.